İstanbul 95 Şehir ve Oyun Konferansı'nın ikinci günündeyiz. Evet, Türkçe açacağım. Sonra o şey, panel İngilizce devam edecek. Onun için kulaklığa ihtiyacı olanlar şimdiden alırsa iyi olur. Ee, sabahki oturumumuzda önce üç tane sunum dinleyeceğiz. Ee, sonra dün de e, yaptığımız gibi üç kişi gelip o sunumlarda e, altı kişi hep beraber e, tartışmaya çalışacağız. Ben önce e, sunum yapacakları sahneye çağırayım diyorum. Ondan sonra ilerleyelim. Önce Yens Artı sahneye davet ediyorum. E, please, e, then we'll proceed with the presentation. Jens UNICEF için Shaping Organization for Children, A Handbook on Child Responsive Urban Planning kitabını yazdı. Yakın zamanda e, yayınlandı. Bu UNICEF'in kent planlama alanında çıkardığı ilk rapor. E, dolayısıyla bizim burada bir süredir yapmaya çalıştığımız gibi çocuk ve kent planlama alanlarını birbirine e, nasıl diyelim birbiriyle görüştüren, konuşturan önemli çalışmalardan bir tanesi. Onun için e, bu alanda ikimize umut veren bir çalışma. Yani öncesinde e, Flaman ve Brüksel Bölge Hükümetlerine de e, danışmanlık yaptı. Aynı zamanda bir meslektaş da diyebilirim. İnşaat mühendisliği okumuş. E, daha sonra da e, planlama, şey planlama eğitimi almış. Yani please e, have a seat and then we proceed with the presentation. Aynı zamanda Simon'ı davet etmek istiyorum. Öyle mi diyorsun? Peki, davet etmiyorum Simon'ı. Sonra davet ettiğimde tanıtacağım Simon ve Elvanda'yı. O zaman önce, yani sorry for the confusion. Ee, önce sunum sonra şeymiş, öyle işte bir Serban. Master of Serban'ı. <gülüyor> Buyurun. It's also reflecting how I've developed the handbook. It's 
It's actually going about three questions. It's about the why question, why it is important to invest into urban planning for children. Secondly, actually, what is then the focus or what are, what's the play field where urban planners can intervene? And thirdly, also how you have to do things, because that's of course the most Im important question to answer in a hand, like to try, try to be very hands-on and to offer you something that you can use from tom tomorrow on. Um, the why question, there's, a, there's different angles to, to look at the why question and I think w for, from the United Nations perspective or international development, it also includes the donors, for example, the foundations, the, the national donors that are involved. There has been a major shift that has been made when they have realigned what are like development goals. If you compare, and yesterday Cecilia was also mentioning this, you see at the Millennium Development Goals that were actually the goals uh, with the horizon 2015 that at the left side you saw that there's actually only one goal in which there's one indicator that indicates something that had to do with cities and that's the, the indicator that, made an, that projected an ambition to reduce slums. That was the only indicator that said something about built environment or urban planning. If you see in the sustainable development goals that are now the new agenda for 2030, you see there's more goals, but it's also much more clear that built environment and infrastructure become very important. There's like nine goals, which you have multiple indicators that highlight this. And there's also one goal specifically that highlights that the development of sustainable cities and communities is very important. So that's, a, I would say that the United Nations or the international development community has now much, uh, a much more interesting compass, I think, to also come with a specific agenda for uh, urban planning for people and for children. Now, another thing that has to be clear is that the challenges are very big, so there's maybe a more interesting compass, but um, it, the challenges are very big. There's still a lot of slums, and if you also look at what's still coming, upon us, there's still like one million people uh, in a very short, uh, one billion people will have to be hosted in cities and there's very weak urban planning cap capacity in general in the world. You also see that cities are actually not automatically places where prosperity is available. Right? So there's an urban paradox that there's prosperity for some, but there's also a lot of inequity. And if you see towards the lens of inequity, which is a specific lens that UNICEF uses a lot, because it wants to work, of course, for the most disadvantaged children, that you see also there's a spatial component of this inequity. And I translated in the handbook, in, there's 22 examples I give of spatial inequity, and I, I compose them in three categories that are also very recognizable for children development specialists, but there's a lot of spatial inequity that induces health constraints, participation constraints and uh, protection constraints. And um, I don't go into detail, but there's, for example, two major things that are already on, on, the, on the radar uh, within UNICEF and that I've been talked about yesterday. It's, for, for example, air pollution. Uh, every year, nearly 600,000 children under the age of five die from diseases caused or exacerbated by the effects of indoor and outdoor air pollution. And we know that in cities, the outdoor pollution is majorly caused by bad energy management in, in, in buildings and uh, in, in transportation uh, because of the fossil fuel private driven cars. Secondly, what's also very, very challenging, it's really an epidemia, is that there's a huge prevalence of road traffic injuries among adolescents. So it has now be, become the number one cause of death amongst adolescents globally. And so this is also something that actually makes you wonder that all the road infrastructure that is made out of, with a vision of prosperity, actually is a kind of place where actually a lot of adolescents' children die when they already had this investment of education, health. So that's also a very big problem. So in the handbook where we also, what I wanted to highlight is that there's a lot of systems, urban systems, where you can intervene as an urban planner. You should intervene to make a city really healthy 
uh, a place where there's protection, a place where there's participation. I also try to define better like what are like areas of impact, because that's also in interesting for how can could you measure positive impact, what, what kind of indicators you could use. I try to find um, a set of benefit areas that are very recognizable and for urban planners and for uh, children development specialists. So I came up with five um, benefit areas, health, safety, citizenship, environmental sustainability, and prosperity. And if you do an exercise also, how you can intervene and actually have impact in these benefit areas through all these urban systems, you see there's a lot you can do in different ways on a small scale and a larger scale. Also looking at benefits and impacts for children it's also very important to look actually at the ecology of childhood because it's not only about providing a space from a kind of supply attitude, providing a space that's healthy, but it's also the space is a place where behaviors are adopted, behaviors are developed because children are fantastic learners, but you could also say like if you don't offer good examples and good ways that they can learn, they become also those, the citizens in the future that will manage our cities in an unsustainable way. So it's very important to look at um, the, the city as a space where both supply happens but also behaviors are adopted. I'm going to skip this. Um, it's also about the, the pace is so large and the scale is so large that we will not be able to do it alone as a kind of urban planning expert in an ivory tower. We really have to work with a lot of uh, people, especially with children and communities. And I think this, this person I, it inspired me a lot. It's Alejandra Aravena. He's the winner of the Pritzker Prize, which is a kind of Nobel Prize of Architecture in 2016. And he said very clearly that um, we will have to build one million, uh, every week a city of one million people with very reduced resources, and that's a challenge. We have to be very smart, innovative, and it will only be that by building it with people in a very incremental, smart way. Now, the how question, that's the third part, and the most important part of the book, is actually to give guidance like what can be practically done. And so I have listed all the instruments, urban planning instruments that um, urban planners can use, and I've not invented it myself, I've, I've read a lot of other guidance from specialist organizations, from NACTO, from um, other globally uh, working organizations, and I think there's three types of instruments that has to be used and reused or adjusted in a, in a, in a, in a specific way. First of all, of course, there's instruments that are about planning spaces and building spaces, and they go from very project, small project oriented quick wins towards more uh, structural land use and urban uh, planning regulation tools. Secondly, there's a lot of tools that uh, urban planners can use to actually engage much better participation of children in the uh, communities. And thirdly, also use the urban planning data that are provided by GIS or by this participation uh, mechanism in which you do self-assessments, that all this data is better used to quantify progress and use it also to push for uh, new political ag agendas. Um, I don't go into detail, but I went quite detailed to also understand that that there's probably in every situation, in every cities, there are things that can be improved. A lot of cities might be very successful in doing small projects, we might not have yet found a solution to embed good practice in uh, larger scale city development plans, for example. Um, the same with, with stakeholder engagement or participation. I think what often happens is that there's a lot of interest, general interest, but then the financing, the commitment to finance things uh, is not there yet. And that's also very important, of course, if you have good ideas or if you all understand that there's a case to make to invest in children, you also practically have to finance that. And thirdly, I think that the data evidence, there's so much innovation now in 
data collection and also like open source management, that, that is super powerful. It's not like that it changes the practice, because the, the, the instruments that you use traditionally are still very valid, but I think the communication that you can do and also the visualization and inspiration you can achieve with this um, is very important. I just wanted to finish with some, oh, I have two minutes, that's okay. Um, some examples uh, that I also selected in my handbook, which are 27 examples that I found uh, with, with collaborators screening, let's say, good reviews, um, internet, um, and which I found very interesting because they highlight at one time very specifically what they have achieved in terms of impact and also explain a bit like how important the, the availability and the voice of children are in making these projects happen. So for example, this is a project um, from I IFRC. It's, um, it's, uh, it's called PASA, which is actually an, a very interesting interactive um, tool to actually make self-assessments in neighborhoods with children where they actually analyze how safe their neighborhood is. And this is more seen from a perspective of, in the first place, disaster risk reduction. So it's in areas where there's environmental issues, climate change, natural disasters, but it's actually also a tool that could be used for more social safety aspects. And then they can also go online and discuss this uh, amongst each other and so communicate it in their community. Another example is that Barcelona, for example, is a city where you have a lot of open source data and you can quickly actually analyze where, in, in which street, the proportion of the street dedicated to uh, foot walks, uh, pathways and uh, pedestrian areas is very weak. So here you see like the dark areas, although of course Barcelona has this famous reputation to be very walkable, but there's still a lot of uh, streets that are very poorly walkable and so you can very easily see on a map in a very specific street where there's still a lot of efforts to be done. Of course, you see that uh, in, in, the, in some areas there's a very good result, in the light areas and in some areas there's still a lot of problems. Um, another project is um, Unidades de Vida Articulada, which is um, actually a project in Medellin where you have a lot of water uh, resource tanks that preserve the water uh, in, the, in, the, in the city, but they're actually designed as public spaces, whereas normally they would be seen as very functional spaces that are isolated and, and, and, and, and excluded or enclosed and not accessible. And so it also allows people to see these spaces in a very conscious way that this is very important, the water management of the school, uh, of, the, of the city. Another project and I think this is not new, but it's super powerful, I think, if you work with children. Of course, use their schools, actually, as places where you don't learn something traditional, but you learn, actually, uh, sustainable behaviors. And so, investing into uh, roofscapes where you actually grow food, you learn about healthy food behaviors, is very important for children. This is a project in Vietnam. Also about waste management, a lot of uh, slum areas are actually not only terrible because there's no services, but there's also terrible because of the environmental issues. And so a lot of uh, small rivers are clogged with waste, uh, there's no waste management. And this is a project in Nairobi, in the, slum of, um, in the slums over there, where through participatory uh, planning, at once children and the communities clean that waste think about how they can better manage it and also create, because of taking the dirt away, suddenly there's public spaces along these small rivers that appear. Um, almost the final project and then I'm done. This is a project on energy and clean air where you see that nowadays the devices to measure actually air pollution become very cheap and they're also very easily um, to make or to install as an individual. And this city, Antwerp in, in Belgium, has asked actually citizens to put these air pollution devices on the, on the wall where they live. So there's actually an online uh, real-time measurement of the pollution 
And so it's very easy to create a political agenda because the pollution <laughs> is too, too high. And so there's very much pressure now to have results immediately before the election, for selection starting in two months, to engage politicians to solve that problem of air pollution, which is, again, a big issue for small children. And then finally, this is a project from Indonesia where um, actually people are, thanks, thanks to this open source data and the, and the devices and the apps that exist, are able to uh, par participate in the budgeting of their neighborhood. So they can easily communicate amongst each other to actually very precisely define the annual budget of the neighborhood where it will be allocated for. And it's also very interesting as a, as a mechanism of citizenship, of course, to engage with people also about like practically we have so much money how do we invest it and also for children so i just wanted to finalize with one thing that i think we have to do from unicef is that we have to invest actually in creation the development the capacity development of urban planners and we have to create more urban planners and that the urban plans that we educate that they should be focusing specifically on urban plans because it's, no, it's really not realistic to think that there's only urban planners that can solve it. So we have to find urban planners that understand the participation of children is important, to engage them and to also make them part of the solution. And one thing I, I, I think is important is to, maybe if you receive the handbook and want it's online, to go to the checklist and to maybe quickly see like what you can do in your own uh, municipality or in your own situation, and how you can also uh, contribute to uh, making uh, cities more child responsive. So that's uh, my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions.